All right, well, we're going to hold that hope that um, the projector will come back to life. <clears throat> In the meantime, <clears throat> what we're going to do tonight is we're going to have a good old-fashioned Bible study. So if you have a Bible, you really want to have it at hand. Uh, we're going to be studying from Revelation 16. Of course, there's going to be other texts, but Revelation 16 is what we're going to study tonight. Um, and so if you could go to Revelation 16 with your Bibles... And we're going to go there in a moment. Now, some of you may have noticed, some of you may have noticed that I have, well, I have a son and a daughter. And my daughter is about a year old. She's going to be a year old next month. How many of you have heard of a person that was pregnant and didn't know they were pregnant? Have you heard of that story before? It happens all the time, right? <laughs> well, my first slide was going to be a picture of a woman. Her name was, is Claire Wiseman. She's not dead. <laughs> and she was pregnant. And you can see a picture whenever this comes back. You'll see a picture of her. And she, looks, she, she doesn't look pregnant at all. She took a picture about when she was six months pregnant and then about four weeks before she gave birth. And you could not tell. You seriously could not tell that she was pregnant. So my wife would have very much liked to have been like Claire <laughs> and not realized she was pregnant. She had a very difficult, actually both of her pregnancies was very difficult. They were very difficult. Um, but Claire actually ended up giving birth in her uh, kitchen. And she says that, you know, she was, uh, she was on birth control. She was having her periods. She could not tell she was pregnant. And all of a sudden she gets these period cramps and her mother is like, are you pregnant? And she's like, no, I'm not. And then she, there, there comes out the, be, the head of the baby. <laughs> and she's like, oh, I guess I am pregnant. Uh, so <clears throat> is it possible that there are people in this world that don't know that there is something big coming? Is it possible there are people that don't know that the end is coming? And here's the really scary, scary picture, uh, question. The really scary question is, is it possible that there are Christians that will be shocked when they see Jesus coming on the clouds? Now, Jesus gave us some signs. Who knows what the signs are? Where are the signs in the Bible? Matthew 24, right? Matthew 24 is a place where we see the signs of the end. Jesus says that there would be wars and rumors of wars. What else does Matthew 24 say? That there will be famine, pestilence, earthquakes. But you know, people read that and they forget that Jesus said these are the beginnings of sorrows. This is not the end. This is the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of the end. How many people have died from COVID-19? Does anybody know? Have you looked it up recently? <laughs> it's a big number, right? It's a big number about, I want to say, 6.9, 6, 6 million 908 or something like that as of last count. Now, that was a big pandemic. But still, the world continued, right? I mean, at the beginning of 2020, it seemed like something may not continue. Something may happen. But COVID-19 actually did not stop they did not bring the end of the world. Now, people today, they are looking and waiting for one big cataclysm, one big event that's going to change everything, that will collapse civilization. What do you think? Does the Bible say that we're going to experience that? That they will come a big apocalypse to tell us that Jesus is ready to come. Well, Jesus actually told us that that's not how the end would, would come. Let's go to Luke 17, Luke chapter 17. This is the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament. Luke 17, and we'll read verses 26 and onward. So Luke 17, beginning in verse 26, Jesus is talking about the end of the age. Luke 17, Pastor Rob actually mentioned this yesterday. In Luke 17, 
verse 26, Jesus is talking about the condition of the world before Jesus comes. So what does Jesus say to his disciples, to the people, will be the world like when he comes? Luke 17, verse 26, And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Verse 28, Likewise as it was also in the days of Lot. Who was Lot? Abraham's nephew. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot, oh, the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day of the Son of Man. What is the day of the Son of Man is revealed? What is Jesus getting at here? What is his point? Things are just going to keep going on as usual, right? The sun will come out. So what does this tell us about World War III? What about, is there going to be nuclear war, war, a nuclear winter? Is there going to be a big pandemic that kills most of the people in the planet? No. Jesus says it's going to be business as usual until the day that the Son of Man is revealed. So this is very important because... As I understand, there are some people that think that there's going to be a secret rapture. And after the secret rapture, that's when you're going to see the big cataclysm. That's when you're going to see the big events. So what happens is people are waiting for that secret rapture. They're waiting for that special apocalypse, the special event that's going to tell the whole world, okay, now we need to get serious about this heaven thing. But we're going to see that Jesus says, that's not how it's going to happen. The, G the coming of Jesus is going to be very different. Before Jesus comes, will there be a cataclysm? Will there be an apocalypse? Well, Jesus does talk about in Revelation, the book of Revelation talks about a war that is coming. There's going to be a full-blown war, but it's not going to be a war of weapons, a war of tanks, it's going to be a war against God's truth and his people. Those who have sided with the beast, with Satan, with the false prophet, they're going to be on one side. And then God and his people are going to be on the other. And there is a name for this war. And tonight we're going to talk about the battle of Armageddon. So let's go to our first question. The first question is, what great crisis will this world soon face. I know that you can't really tell very well what's, what it says there, but it's the first question, what great crisis will this world soon face? Revelation 16, 16. If you cannot read it, let's go to Revelation 16, 16. The first answer is found in Revelation 16, 16. And it says, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon. Have you heard of the battle of Armageddon before? Yeah, I think most people have. Do you know anything about the battle of Armageddon? Do you, is there anything you know? Let's just start there. What do you know about Armageddon? It is, what kind of battle is it? Ah. So some people have been listening to <laughs> the presentations. What happens in this battle is not going to be a literal battle. But you know what? Something interesting is that every battle in history is named after the place where it happens, right? I think most battles, maybe not every, but most battles are named after the place where they happen. Is there a place called Armageddon? Well, tonight we're going to find out. But before we do that, we want to study the seven last plagues because the Battle of Armageddon happens at the sixth plague. So let's go now to Revelation 16 and we're going to talk about the seven last plagues. What will be poured out on those individuals who worship the beast? This is question number two. Well, verse, Revelation 16, verse 17. 
Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. By the way, who could possibly be speaking here? Does anybody have any idea who's speaking from the throne? Well, based on what he says, we're going to see the identity of this individual. So Revelation 14, now, this is going back a few chapters. If you want to stay in Revelation 16, that's fine. But this is Revelation 14, 9. This is what we studied yesterday, actually. This is the third angel's message. Yesterday we studied the three angels' message. This is the third angel's message. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself also he shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Now, this, there's this wine of the wrath of God, but we previously had studied a different kind of wine. Do you recall that there's another wine that Babylon gives to drink to people? What does the wine of Babylon, does anyone remember what the wine of Babylon represents? The falsehoods, the lies, the deceit, right? The wine of Babylon represents the false doctrines and lies with which she deceives the whole world. But this message says that God is going to give of his, his wine, the wine of his wrath, to the people that have drunk from the wine of Babylon. He shall be tormented. These are the people that received the, the wine of the wrath. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. In the Bible, when is the last time you read about fire and brimstone? Is there a, pl is there a place in the Bible? Is there a story in the Bible that talks about fire and brimstone? Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. And what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Fire and brimstone came down and consumed them. It destroyed them. Now, what kind of destruction did they experience in Sodom and Gomorrah? It was a complete destruction, absolute. There was nothing left except the smoke, right? In fact, the smoke of the torment. So the kind of destruction that the people that drink from the wine of, of the wrath of God is a complete and absolute destruction. There will be nothing left but the smoke. So let's read. This is actually from your lesson. So you have, if you have the lesson, you can read this. I forget, this is on question number, um, well, here's number three. Is that three? Okay. So this is what your lesson says. When every human being has chosen between the mark of the beast or the seal of God, the plagues will fall. A loving God would not possibly allow the place to fall without giving each individual the opportunity to avoid them. Okay, <clears throat> so that was actually question number two. This is question number three. What is the wrath of God unmingled with mercy? What is the wrath of God? Well, that question can be answered simply by Revelation 15, 1 says, then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them, what was in them? The wrath of God is complete. So the seven last plagues is the complete wrath of God. Now, why is it that it's unmingled with grace? What does that tell you about other plagues that we've studied? In the seven seals, for example, there were other plagues. Those plagues were mingled with grace. That means that God did not mean to destroy everybody. In fact, remember this is only a third of the, of the earth will be hurt by this particular plague. This kind of plagues are going to affect everybody. It is the full wrath of God. Question number four, upon whom does the first plague fall? Revelation 16, verse 1. 
Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Verse two, so the first went, out, went and poured out his bowl upon the earth and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. So the first play falls upon the people that have the mark of the beast and worship his image. Now this play of swords before we've mentioned is one of the plagues of Egypt. It was a visitation of God's judgment upon Egypt. Now even with Egypt, God was merciful, right? He did not destroy them all. But these kinds of plagues, the place of the seven last plagues that we're going to see, are reminiscent of the place of Egypt. In fact, I think all of them are straight from the place of e plagues of Egypt. Okay, question number five. What statement shows that Christ's work as our intercessor has been completed when the seven last plagues are fallen? This is very important. So we've been studying how Revelation shows what Jesus is doing in heaven right now for us. Right? There was a point where Jesus was in the altar instance, in the, most, in the holy place. Then he transitioned to the most holy place, the mercy seat. Right? Jesus was making intercession for us. But something very interesting happens when the seven last plagues are taking place. It says in Revelation 15, 8, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So what does this tell you? If no one is able to enter the temple, means that intercession is over. Now in ancient Israel, if you wanted to be cleansed of your sins, if you wanted forgiveness for sins, you went to the temple, you took your sacrifice, right? And the priest interceded for you. Well, the temple is closed. Actually, this happened in ancient Israel as well, right? The glory of the Lord will come. No one could go in, right? It was inaccessible. Well, no one is able to enter the temple at this time, which means there is no one interceding in the most holy place. This is why we are to understand that the place fall and there is no mercy. There's no grace for the people on earth because there's no one in heaven interceding for them. There's no one pleading grace for them. And you know what? This also means that it is no longer possible to change sides. If you have chosen to be on the side of the beast, well, that's where you're going to stay. It's no longer possible to get into the temple. We read about Noah. There was a period there was a period about seven days, right? When the angel came and closed the door of the ark. There was no flood. And yet there was a short period where Noah was inside the ark and the people were outside the ark, the rest of the people. No one could go in or out. There was no flood, but no one could enter the ark. It seems that during the seven last plagues, no one will be able to change size. But this is not yet the end. This is why in Revelation 22, 11, Jesus says, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. In other words, you've made your choice. Stay, you know, keep it. Stay at it. Because the time of the end is already here. So let's review brief, briefly what we've learned about the seven, excuse me, the six plagues. So the first plague was a, a, a plague of sores. The second one, the sea turns to blood. Now we didn't read all these verses, but they're there in, in chapter 16. The third plague, the rivers and bodies of water turn to blood. The fourth plague is sun scorching men. We're gonna read about that. Then darkness falls upon the seed of the beast, the throne of the beast, and then comes Armageddon. So the first six plays are from the source to Armageddon. What do you think happens on the seventh plague? Jesus comes. So something important about the seven last plagues. 
they fall upon all of humanity. Okay, they affect everybody. We're going to see when it says the sun was scorching men. Well, if the sun is heating up the earth, that means that everyone on the earth is experiencing a hotter sun. The fifth plague it strikes the very seat of Satan's power. Um, and it's interesting because all the other plagues, one to four, they're affecting everyone on the earth. But the fifth plague especially only affects the seed of Satan's power. It is as if God is saying, okay, so you've been listening to the beast of the false, false, false prophet? Well, let me tell you, they do not speak for me. Let me make it abundantly clear that they are not speaking on my behalf. And yet, Satan will have a way to get around this, to continue to deceive the nations. We're going to see what he does. Question number six. After the first six plagues, what announcement comes from heaven? Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed, here's one of those beatitudes, blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, this comment by Jesus he seems to be saying to his people, well, he seems to be saying to everybody that's reading Revelation, it's very important that you understand something. You're not going to know when this pl the plagues are going to fall. I'm not going to tell you. You're not, you can't go to Revelation, try to figure it out, put the dates. Right? This is not a time prophecy. You're not going to know when the time of probation ends. Right? Jesus didn't tell Noah, on such a date, I'm going to close the door. He didn't know that, right? And when Jesus closes the temple and says, we're done here, we're not going to know that. So that's what Jesus says, it's going to be like a thief. No one knows when this is going to happen. So you just have to be ready for it. Because if you're not ready, well, you're stuck on the side that you've chosen. 2 Peter 3.10, he's... Uh, he says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. This is contrary to some beliefs concerning the rapture, the secret rapture, about the seven years of tribulation, all these things. We are just not going to know when the day of the Lord comes. It's going to come as a thief in the night. You have to be ready for it. Revelation 16, 15 says, Behold, I'm coming uh, as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. So in the Bible, nakedness is a symbol of the shame of sin. I think you already know that if you don't want to be found naked, what do you need to wear? A robe, a white robe of righteousness, Christ's righteousness. This is the only way that you can be ready for the coming of Christ. You have to have your garments. Friends, we don't want to experience this seven last place. That's the one thing. If you get nothing else out of this lesson, is that we don't want to experience any of them. We want to be found clothed in Christ's righteousness. Question number seven, what is the first plague to fall? And how does it affect human beings? Revelation 6, 2, we already read this. So the first went out, poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. Upon what do the second and third plagues fall? So this, again, is from, I believe, question number seven. is a comment in your, in your lesson. The plagues are not arbitrary scourges on the part of God. They, they are eternal principles which govern the universe. One is the law of sowing and reaping. The seeds of evil carry with them their own deadly results. The first plague falls upon those who have the mark of the beast. So again, this is from your lesson. The beast power, which enforces the mark of the beast, says, unless you receive the mark, you will be physically harmed. In the first plague, those who receive the mark of the beast are physically afflicted. 
The first plague clearly reveals that there is no physical security outside of Jesus Christ. Um, we're going to read how in Babylon, we're going to study that, I believe, tomorrow. In Babylon, people are rich and comfortable, right? That's one of the features of being in Babylon. Life is easy. For the saints, life is not easy. But for the people that are in Babylon, it's comfortable, it's safe, or it's seemingly safe. And all of a sudden, there comes the seven last plagues, and no one is comfortable anymore. So Jesus is making a point to the inhabitants of the earth. Verse 3, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. This is straight from the plagues of Egypt. Revelation 6, 16, 4, Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. So, the second and third plagues are about the waters becoming, turning like blood. Question number nine, why do the rivers and waters turn to blood during the third plague? And here is something very, this is straight from what Jesus says, right? In Revelation 16, 5, this is in verse 5, and I heard the angel of the water saying, you are righteous, O Lord. The one who is, who was, who is to be, because you have judged these things. So the judgment of God is what's being displayed here. Like we're, we're being told exactly what we're reading. This is about justice. This is about God performing, giving justice. Now, who was crying out for justice in Revelation 7? Do you recall? There was a group of people the saints, right, at the foot of the altar saying, how long, O Lord, before you avenge us? Well, here's the answer. Here is God performing justice. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. Actually, it literally says, for they are worthy. <laughs> They're worthy of what's happening to them. Now the saints are worthy of Jesus by his blood. But these people that have shed the blood of the saints, they are worthy, they're due, the drinking of this blood. And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So, even in his wrath, God demonstrates that he is a just God. Again, it's not a capricious, it's not a random thing that God is doing here. Even in his wrath, his wrath is not like our wrath. <laughs> when we're angry, we'll just, we don't know what we're doing, right? Like we lose control and we just say things and do things that we don't mean. But God's wrath is not like that. God's wrath is full of righteous judgment. Question number 10, as, as the human race is thirsting for water, what happens to the sun during the fourth plague? Revelation 16, 8. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. Now, we've been talking about how there has been a change from the day of worship. One was the seventh day, and now there is the, the day of the sun. Ironically, it is the sun that will scorch men in the last days. The very symbol that they had chosen, their man-made symbol, will be an object of judgment for them. They will suffer because of the sun. Now, I don't know if this has anything to do with what's happening with the climate today. <laughs> Maybe this will be completely unrelated, although I think there's some sort of justice in that somewhere is in Revelation, I think in Revelation 10, it says that God is coming to judge the destroyers of the earth. Well, I think there'll be some justice in that the destroyers of the earth are going to suffer the consequences of destroying the earth. So, what is the fifth plague and where does it specifically fall? Revelation 16, 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness. So the fifth angel is going straight for the seat of the throne of the beast, where the beast is reigning. And his kingdom is full of darkness. 
Uh, we know what darkness represents in the Bible. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. Now, I think we have to understand that this darkness comes with other gifts. It's not just darkness, it's not that it's very dark. It is a painful plague that falls upon the people of the earth. Uh, well, specifically about the, uh, above those who are in the same place where the beast reigns. They, they blasphemed the God of heaven because their pain and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. So we know that it is the close of probation. We know that people are not going to change sides. But clearly, it's not because that God doesn't want them to change sides. They themselves have no desire to change their minds about God. They're suffering what is clearly the punishment of God, the judgments of God. And in their rebellion, they still blaspheme God. Instead of saying, well, it's what we deserve, right? We fought against the saints. We killed the prophets and the, and the, the righteous people. We deserve this punishment. We deserve our pain. No, they do not repent. They blaspheme God. Question number 12, what are some ways a loving God will protect his people during the place? Now, there are many, many verses that we could go to, but there's especially one place in the book of Psalms. Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. Um, so this psalm is about all about how God is going to protect his people. Now, this is a psalm that applies to us today, right? It's not just for the people at the time of the end, but especially when the people of God are probably the least favored people on the earth during the seven last plagues, we're going to want to remember this psalm that we need to abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I will trust. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. How do you think, so the saints, the remnant church, you know, they're going to be running away from the beast, from the false prophet. How do you think that we are going to spend our time as we're being persecuted? What will give us the strength to continue? We're going to worship, and we're going to remember the Word of God, right? We're going to sing psalms. We're going to remember the things, the verses. All the things that we have read, that is going to be our shield and our buckler, he says. The truth of God will give us that hope that we need to get by. And you know what? Today, especially today, we need that truth. We need to carry it with us. It needs to be our shield and buckler today. Because we're suffering already. We're living in the last days already. Amen. It may not be the end of time, but we're living in the times of the end. And we need the word of God to help us. We need the word of God, the truth of God, to sustain us. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, and it shall not come near you. You know, the last time I quoted this, I was talking to some friends. This was right after the earthquake that happened in Turkey. Now, I was not in Turkey at the time, but some of you that may know me know that I lived seven years in Turkey. And I was a missionary there. Um, and I actually know some of the people that were affected by the earthquake. I know some of the people lost friends and family. Now, as far as I could tell, nobody None of my church members over there, none of my friends were directly affected by the earthquake. So when we are suffering persecution, when we're suffering from the truth of God, we're going to want to remember this verse. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. We really don't want to be partakers on the seven plagues. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. So, the promise for the people of God is that they will not partake 
in the seven last plagues. We will be saved from the plagues. Just like the people of Israel, the people of Israel were unscathed by the ten plagues of Egypt, the people of God will be saved from the curse of the, ten, of the seven last plagues. Question 13, what assurance does God give us that he will feed us during this time? Ah, so this is about food now. Isaiah 33, 16 says, he will dwell on high, his place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him, his water will be sure. Now, Elijah, was taken to the brook Kerith, and he received food from the ravens and water from the brook. What else was given to Elijah in that place? Have you thought about that? Well, protection, yes. But you know what Elijah didn't have? A nice bed. No air conditioning, no bathroom. I mean, I guess he was in the outdoors. But the point is, God, pro God promises to give us sustenance, right? He promised to give us enough to survive, but that doesn't mean that we will not suffer discomfort. So, one of the big problems that we have in the church here in the West, in the United States, is that we really do not want to suffer discomfort. We like where we are, we're comfortable, right? Uh, that's not wrong, but we know that the Bible says that when the time comes, we're going to have to suffer some discomfort. Now, God is going to take care of us. He's going to give us enough to survive. But we need to be willing to sacrifice something for the Lord. Actually, more than something. We need to be willing to sacrifice everything for God. So, when somebody says to you, Hey, come tell me about your Jesus Christ. And you say, Well, you know what? Uh... Let me get back to you. I have uh, some things to do. I'm a little busy. You know. Oh, I had a long day at work. You know, I, I really would like to do that. But um, boy, I'm so tired. Now, there's going to come a time where we're going to have to suffer a lot more than a loss of time. We're going to have to give up everything for Jesus. So we need to prepare for that. We need to train. Right? We need to get used to the idea. You know what, Elijah did not have anything but food and bread and water. I think I can do a little more. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will see the land that is very far off. Okay, question 14. How will Satan attempt to unite all nations to destroy God's people in Earth's last war? So, here comes the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 16, 14. Let's go back to Revelation 16. For there are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world. Now, we know that the whole world, the whole world has already received the mark of the beast at this point, right? Like everybody has made a decision for Christ or against Christ. Nevertheless, the beast... The false prophet, they are leading people, right? They need to gain their confidence. Now, after the seven last plays come, well, after the first six, after they come, what do you think is going to happen to the leaders, right? The beast, the, the false prophet, what do you think? Do you think people are going to want to listen to them? They're going to see the plagues and say, hey, I don't think these people are speaking for God. I don't think these plays are coming because we're so good. Well, in that moment, Satan, the Bible says, is going to use supernatural signs to deceive the people, to gain them back. Now, it's not, not going to be very difficult because they already have received the mark of the beast. They already want to be deceived. You know, maybe I shouldn't mention this, but sometimes I feel when I talk to people on the internet that there are some people that want to be deceived, <laughs> that they're looking for lies to believe. I don't know how to explain it, but I say, well, why, how do you even find this? Why are you telling me about this? Sometimes people that are not living and following Jesus, they're not living with God, they're looking for lies to believe. And I think the people that receive the mark of the beast are going to be those kind of people. They're going to see the signs from heaven. They're going to see the plagues. 
And then Satan comes and performs some kind of trick, and they're going to say, oh, I guess, you know, I guess that's okay. Maybe, maybe, after all, this is not from God. And then what is the reason Satan needs to use the signs? Verse 14 says, to gather them to, to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. What is that battle? And by the way, how many people are going to gather for this battle? According to this previous text. Let's go back to the text. Uh, it says, to the kings of the earth and to the whole world. When was the last time that the world was united in one purpose? When was the last time that we saw that? Actually, there's a place in the Bible. We studied it last week or the week before. Babel, very good. The last time that the whole world came together and says, we're gonna do something great. We're gonna unite all our heads together and we're gonna create something great. A great city, a great tower. Well, this will be at the end of time when there's gonna be seven billion plus people on the planet. And it says that the whole world is gonna gather together and they're gonna go fight with the beast and with Satan against the Lord. What is this battle called? Well, I think you know the answer to that. Revelation 16, 16, and they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. So I asked you at the beginning, is there a place called Armageddon, right? Because if it's a battle of Armageddon, battles are named after the place. Where is this place called Armageddon? Well, the word Armageddon in Greek, Armageddon, only occurs here in Revelation. I, I actually have forgotten about this. There's only one mention of Armageddon in the Bible, and it's here in this verse. The word combines the Hebrew words Har for mountain and Magedon. Now, Magedon is a reference to the Israelite city of Megiddo. And that's a picture there, I don't know if you can see it very well. That's a picture of Tel Megiddo today. Actually, that place is still being excavated. Now, I don't know if you can see there in the background, but you see a lot of green, lush green grass and plants there. If you've ever been to Israel, especially during the summer months, you would know that it's not a place with a lot of green. And the reason this city is surrounded by greenery is because it's located in the Valley of Jezreel. Now all of this is important because the place of the battle, or the name of the battle is the Battle of Mount Megiddo. And Megiddo is in a valley. So you kind of see there's a problem there. <laughs> so the first thing we have to remember is that this obviously, obviously this is not a real place. And thank God for that. I want to I wanna personally thank God for having thought about this ahead of time. <laughs> because if this had been a real place, this had been Mount Zion, for example. Mount Zion is a real place. You can go to Jerusalem, and there are two mounts, Mount Moriah and Mount Zion. If this had been a real place, you know what would happen? Many, many Christians would have said, this is the spot. We're going to go and build our houses. We're going to build towers. We're going to prepare for the great battle of Mount whatever. But on purpose, I believe, John picked the name of a place that does not exist. There is no such place as the mountain of Megiddo. Now, the word Megiddo, however, does tell us something about Armageddon. The word Megiddo means, I don't know if this is the next slide. No. <laughs> the word Megiddo means uh, it comes from a, a word in Hebrew, uh, Moed. And you know what that word means? It means congregation. Now, I can give you a lot of references. You can find it in the Bible. But there's, in particular, there's one place in the Bible that we're concerned with for this word, Har Moed, the mountain of congregation, or the mount of congregation. Do you recall that there is a place in Isaiah where the Bible says uh, there was an angel trying to get to the mount of congregation? The Mount of Congregation. This is in Isaiah 14, 30, 13. This is speaking about the king of Babylon. However, prophetically, this is not really the king of Babylon. This is the king of the Babylon, the spiritual Babylon, which is, of course, Satan. This is talking about Lucifer. Isaiah 14, 13 says, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. 
I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. So the mount of the congregation is where, prophetically? In heaven, right? If this is speaking about Satan, about Lucifer, the mount of the congregation has to be in heaven. Satan wants to sit on the throne of God. He wants to be surrounded by the angels, giving him glory and praise and honor. So it is not by accident that the last battle on earth, the battle between good and evil, the one that will decide all other battles, is a reference to the first battle in heaven between God, between Christ and Satan. As I said, there is no place known as the mountain of Megiddo. However, Armageddon has to be understand, understand symbolically. And the nearest mountain to Megiddo, remember this is a valley, the nearest mountain to Megiddo is Mount Carmel. What do you recall happened at Mount Carmel? Is there something about Mount Carmel that would tell us about Armageddon? So, these next slides are all going to be in 1 Kings 18. So if you don't want to, you can't read them well, you can go to 1 Kings 18. This is beginning in verse 20 to 21. So I'm just here telling you something that you probably already know, but the verses are important because they're going to tell us everything we need to know about the battle of Armageddon. So King Ahab calls all the children of Israel. By the way, the prophet Elijah says, go and get all the, all the people together. So they gather the prophets, they go to Mount Carmel, and Elijah comes to the people and he says, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, the Lord Yahweh, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Then the people answered him, not a word. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. So this is a big story, but just kind of keep in, in mind the facts of the story, okay? Then fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trench because Elijah had gone and he poured some water. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So that contest was decided. And Elijah said, said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, let them... let." Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Okay, so this is just a review of the story that you probably heard before. Elijah has a big encounter at Mount Carmel. Now, is it fair to say that this was a sort of battle, right? It was not a physical battle, but there was a battle between who? Who were the two people battling? Okay, and they were representatives of God in Baal, right? Now you can see where this is going regarding Armageddon. So here's the battle of Mount Carmel. Number one, King Ahab, Jezebel, Jeze we haven't talked about Jezebel, Jezebel and the false prophets of Baal have led the nation into apostasy and forced wor worship. Because of a spiritual drought, the land is cursed with physical drought for three and a half years. Three and a half years is 1260 days. Elijah, the remnant, right? We're gonna, this is another theme in the Bible. The Elijah, the faithful remnant, is blamed for the nation's troubles. When Ahab sees Elijah, he's like, there comes the one that troubles Israel. And Elijah says, I am not the one that troubles Israel. It is you. But he is blamed for it. The whole nation is gathered in one place to make a decision. The Lord is victorious in Baal and his followers are defeated and destroyed. So this is the battle, the literal battle of Mount Carmel. This is what happened in biblical history. What about the battle of Armageddon? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet have led the nations into apostasy and false worship. Because of spiritual drought, the earth is cursed with the seven last plagues. 
God's remnant church, his people, are blamed for the world's troubles. The whole world is gathered in one place for a decisive battle. Now, you could say that the participants in this battle are not the ones that need to make a decision. Are there more people or creatures in the universe that are watching the battle of Armageddon? Well, there's the people of God, of course. But you know, there's the angels in heaven, right? The angels of heaven are watching the battle of Armageddon. Satan was able to convince a third of the angels in heaven, right? You remember that? You know what that tells me? That at least some of those angels were at least somewhat, you know, they chose God in the end, but they still were somewhat convinced by what Satan was saying at the beginning, right? They had to wonder, hey, a third of my friends have gone over to this side. I have to wonder, are they right? Well, this battle will finally and forever put an end to that question. Who is right in this great controversy between Christ and Satan? This is the decision that's being made forever. The Lord, of course, is victorious, and Satan and his followers are defeated and destroyed. So, the battle of Armageddon is not going to be a physical battle. It's going to be like the one fought in heaven between Michael and his angels, and between Christ and Satan. Question 16 says, as the whole world is mobilized to destroy the people of God, what divine act takes place? Revelation 16, 17 says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. When is the last time you have heard the words, It is done, or it is finished? Who said that? Jesus, Jesus Christ. And why did he say that? What was finished when he said that? The plan of, well, sin was finished, right? Sin was no longer a problem. Anyone that wants to get over sin, anyone wants to be free from sin, because of that, because of his sacrifice, it's finished, it's done. That you no longer have to worry about sin. Now, why is Jesus here? I believe this is Jesus speaking. Why is Jesus saying, it is done, it is finished? What is finished? The battle, the actual battle. Right? The battle of Armageddon, the battle between good and evil, the great controversy. Finally, Jesus can say, it's done. There's no more battle. I have won. Everyone has won now. The people of God, God himself, his angels. Finally, Satan is defeated forever. And there were noises and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake. This also happened when Jesus died. Such a mighty, mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now, the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. By the way, this great city is what we're going to study next, right? What is the great city? Well, we're going to study about that. And great Babylon, well, there's the great city, was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierce, fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. This is 1620. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of the talent. So this is the seven last plague. This is the end. Jesus says it is done. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. Question 17. How is Jesus described in Revelation 19, 11 to 16? So if you can go to Revelation 19, because uh, I'm going to go through this fast because we're running out of time. Revelation 19 says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. Now this happened at the beginning, right? When Jesus introduces himself, in, himself to John in Revelation chapter 1, he says, here's the Faithful and True Witness. Jesus is the Faithful and True Witness. Well, here again in Revelation 19, Jesus is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Even the wrath of God is righteous. His eyes were like flame of fire, and his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with the robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Boy, am I glad that John inserts his title here. The Word of God is mentioned once again. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. 
And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Again, we saw this in uh, the beginning. That with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule with them, or rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In the last moments of time, Jesus returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords with the armies of heavens. And friends, you know what I really like about the Battle of Armageddon? Is that the outcome of the battle is certain. We don't have to wonder who's going to win. So if we happen to be alive when this, these things are happening on the earth, we don't have to wonder what will happen. We know exactly who wins that battle. Friends, I want to be on Jesus' side when the Battle of Armageddon takes place. I want to be with him. I want to be rejoicing when I see his armies coming from heaven. What do we need to do still to be ready? Is there something? If I were to ask you, are you ready for Jesus now to come tomorrow? Are you ready to side with him? If Armageddon were to happen tomorrow, would you be prepared? Would your family be prepared? Friends, we need to make a decision. We cannot wait. We cannot wait to wait to see that great cataclysm come. We cannot wait for the events in the world to tell us, okay, now is the time. Now, Jesus gave us signs, that's true. But the signs were not for you to wait. The signs were, where, were, were for those people that are waiting and prepare for the coming of Jesus. So we want to be ready. Amen. Do you want to be ready? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful that we know the outcome of this battle, Lord. The battle that was begun in heaven many, many eons ago. We know, Lord, that you have already won it. And Lord, we are waiting with anticipation for your coming. We're waiting for the end of this suffering and this terrible things that we see in the world. But Lord, before you come, we want to be sure that we are ready. We want to be ready for your coming. We want to be, and we want our families and friends to be ready as well, Lord. So I pray tonight, Lord, for each person in this room. I pray for their families. I pray for their children, brothers and sisters. I pray, Lord, that you would give us your spirit, that we may be able to be sealed by you, Lord. We want to receive the sealing of the Holy Spirit. We want to receive the seal of God. We want to know that we will be on the right side when you come, Lord. I pray a blessing to each person in this room, and I pray, I pray Lord, that you would help us to decide, to commit, to finally say, I will hold nothing back. I will give everything to Jesus. Because, Lord, you gave everything to, for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.